Um, Walter Bebout was not able to join us today, but um, he sent in his place a very qualified young man, and we're all delighted to, to have Bill here. Um, in 1990, Bill Goodry began his longtime involvement in purebred dogs by competing in junior showmanship, the highlight of which was representing the United States in the International Junior Handler Finals at the 1994 Crest Dog Show in England. He is a breeder, owner, handler of Cocker Spaniels, and is a past president of the Louisiana Kennel Club. From there, he went on to receive his Juris Doctor in Civil Laws from Loyola University in New Orleans College of Law. Phil's AKC experience began in the summer of 2002 when he participated in AKC's summer intern program. He returned to AKC in early 2006 as a member of the internal consulting group and joined the government relations department in January 2007. As the government relations department legislative analyst, that's a very long title. <laughs> <laughs> Phil evaluates proposed legislation for content, context, and legislative intent and provides reasoned legal opinions regarding the potential impact of proposed legislation on the purebred dog community. So far this year, Phil has monitored and addressed approximately 800 total state bills and local ordinances. Currently, Phil is also researching the potential negative implications of both animal guardianship regimes and non-economic damages, and is working on the development of a comprehensive grassroots outreach program. We're delighted that Phil gave you this year. Well, thank you everybody for the really kind welcome. As a lawyer entering a room, sometimes you don't get those nice welcomes. <laughs> I gotta say, Walt uh, does send his regards and is uh, working on a few developing things in the office today. And he gave me uh, one piece of advice before coming in. He said, You're gonna have a target, a bullseye on your back, just duck when you think it's necessary. So, <laughs> anyway, this is his presentation, and uh, I hope I can do him justice as we move forward. But one of the things that we often see, or questions often asked, sort of this background is, what is AKC, why does AKC have an issue with this? Why, why does AKC care? And well, it's quite simple. We look to our mission statement, the mission statement that our board of directors passed several years ago. And the very last clause of that mission statement, I think is, is a perfect um, explanation. We work to protect the rights of all dog owners and promote responsible dog ownership. That's what we do. This allows us to not only work with those, uh, those of you who are fanciers, but with every dog owner in this country, because this is not a fancier issue. This is an issue of rights. This is an issue of liberties. And what affects one affects all. So here's a, just a quick rundown of our agenda. First, we're gonna look at some of the challenges um, that we can deal with in terms of legislation. We'll take a look at some of the electoral politics and governmental politics that we have to deal with. We are inherently a political body in government relations. And it's, it's sort of key understanding the motivations of elected officials sometimes. It's also really difficult. Um, <clears throat> that's a joke, money, please. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, and, um, and, and how exactly we can use these motivations towards positive outcomes. And then some other resources and strategies we can use at AKC to help you in your individual fights on the legislative level. So here's just this quick rundown of some of the major issues that we deal with. We've talked about BSL. And, um, you know, quite honestly, um, it's, this is something that, unfortunately, we're actually seeing a whole lot more of, especially in the local level. Um, thank you very much, Michael Vick, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But <laughs> we're seeing it, we're seeing a lot of uh, breeding permit bills, breeding restriction bills, mandatory spay neuter, again, a lot on the local level. Everybody knows about the California bill that we continue to work on, but, um, you know, the, the local level, not only are these, are these fights increasing in terms of number, but they're also, these battles are, are incredibly difficult to win. And, and as an aside, you know, I think one of the great things about working for government relations is that government relations has a really wonderful track record on the state level. We're very good on the state level. I think the people that we often find ourselves in the organizations, we often find ourselves in opposition to on a lot of these issues, 
know that we have more of an uphill battle, if you will, on the local level. And that's why you've seen things like Miami-Dade, you've seen things uh, uh, recently Dallas, uh, where we have lost these particular battles. So MSN continues and breeding restrictions continue to be one of our major issues, statewide breeders' bills. We saw Virginia, and we mentioned Virginia earlier. We had a bill in Louisiana that, as a native Louisianian, I was, I was very upset to see and, and quickly made a few calls and found out that we had no chance on this green earth to defeat it this, this particular year. Sometimes we see zoning and uh, limit issues, um, usually not so much, but we're getting there more and more in terms of limits <coughs> at the state level. Um, but um, again, the local level sometimes we'll see in cruelty. Our big issue is cruelty. Probably close to 60% of the bills that I've addressed over the course of the past year have been cruelty bills. Guardianship versus ownership. I can go into this a little later. This is one of the uh, scariest uh, avenues for me in the future, I believe, and for us as a whole. Taking animals outside their own property is quite frightening. And then puppy women laws we see uh, to a certain extent. But the aspects of political participation, um, obviously electoral politics, voting in elections, I think is vitally important. And I think some of these issues are, are, are very interesting. Uh, it's been sort of told to us on a number of occasions that maybe one of the things we need to look at is voting blocks, developing voting blocks, blocks of individuals who are gonna vote on a singular issue. And that is the, those issues incumbent to responsible dog breeders and owners. How do, can, I think one of the sort of fundamental questions is, Beyond people like us in this particular room, um, do these people, how many more exist out there? That's the fundamental question. Some special interest organizations have been very good at developing their constituencies as single issue voters. Perhaps that's one of the areas we need to work and develop in the future. So we can say, hey, by the way, in the state, state, uh, the state um, legislative race, we have 15,000 votes. That's going to get some attention. It's definitely going to get some attention. Governmental politics, the actual public policy making process is some of, you know, a, an area that we sort of, we try to focus on, especially when things have been introduced on the state level. Um, when things are sent to policy committee, it's vitally important that we can focus in on what exactly is happening in that policy committee. Are they actually interested in policy? Is it politics at play? Those things are vitally important to consider and get into the door. And then lobbying. Lobbying is... You know, lobbying, it, it is what it is. Why don't we put it that way? Some people, some organizations are very good. I think we're very good at motivating everyone in a grassroots manner. We have to motivate, we have to work in a grassroots manner. Now, let, me, let me address some of the issues that I often hear about AKC. Issue number one, probably more than anything. Why isn't AKC in my jurisdiction fighting this? Why don't we have an AKC presence? It was very simple. I'm located in Raleigh, North Carolina. I vote there, I pay taxes there, that's where I live. In Virginia, if I was in Virginia fighting the British bill for you last year, as soon as it was known that I was from North Carolina and a North Carolina taxpayer, my opinion wouldn't have mattered worth a lick. So here's one of the things that I think is vitally important for everybody to understand about government relations at AKC. We are a tool. It's that simple. We are a tool for you to do, to achieve fantastic outreach to, you, to your lawmakers and your policymakers. You can use us. That's the most important thing. We can help you become the leaders in your communities. That's what we're there for. We're, we, we, we're marginalized any other way. Unless we're talking about a bill in North Carolina or a bill in New York where we're incorporated and our headquarters are, we really don't have that much power. You guys have the power. We can, give you, we can help you realize that. Yes, please. Um, our penalty clause requires that you
we, we do value the privacy of our people, and, and usually they will contact. We say, Here, here's something that's happening in your, your area. We want to have you contact the person that's taking charge, mm -hmm. and they do. If yep. they don't, then, then that's, they're not going to help. Yeah, and we do. We do that. We do that. If you've got anything otherwise, or heard anything otherwise from anybody else in the company, they're, they're actually wrong. If there's a communication that you want, that a club will want, or, or whatever the case is concerning certain bills, you know, all you got to do is tell us what it is you want. We're going to control the message, but we, the, 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 the mess, we're going to control the messaging, but the message will be what you would like us to say within our own realm. Cindy, Cindy first had her, her hand up. Now, I have been begging everyone who would listen for a database. And not necessarily your database, but the dog food companies, um, they have my name and address. They don't worry about my privacy. They send me stuff all the time. They sell my name. The Bar Association, I get stuff from Tiffany's, which I do not shop there, but they think because I'm a member of the bar, I ought to. Um, somehow, if we could put together and fund a professionally managed database, and had the money to do these kinds of mailings. Um, I had a lady called me from Wheeling, West Virginia. She couldn't get any help in her community. She didn't know how to reach out to those people. And we don't have any way of quickly alerting dog owners. And believe me, our opponents not only know who all their people are, they already know who we are too. Yep. And, yes. and so we need to, we need some way to set this up. Absolutely. And the dog food companies have been ducking their head in the sand for a really long time. I think if the registries sat down with them and said, look, we are all in this together. You cannot live on monkey child. Um, <laughs> you've got to help us. I, I don't disagree with anything you just said. At all. At but all. I, because I because we, need, we need a united front. Listen, it, all of our issues really not only deal with dogs and cats, which we've mostly focused upon here today, but you look at this logo and you see that it has to do with every everyone concerned with an animal interest in this country. And so this goes above and beyond coalition building between, say, registries. It goes above and beyond building coalitions between popular companion animals. It goes to the idea of building coalitions with every person in this country who has an interest in, in animals and animal policy. That's where it comes down to. Some states have been very successful at doing this. Um, Missouri pops right in the right hand. They have it down to a science. And they are so good in my job. You know what? I just sort of know what's going on in Missouri by my bill status reports. I don't otherwise, I don't, my policy is if they need me, that's when they'll contact me. They've got it under control because one of the things they've done from the very beginning, they've got the cat people and the dog people and the pig people and the sheep, the sheep people and the... Where do you live? Sorry about that. We film at 11. The sheep people, they've got the cow... You know, all of these folks come together and it works. And it works. But you're absolutely right. I think that's one of the, the things that we can work on and I think that's one of the things that AKC can maybe take, you know, take leadership role in. You know, for a lot of reasons, AKC has looked upon the lead on a lot of issues. And, and, and for a lot of reasons, it's, it's sometimes very difficult. But one of the mantras that I have as I move forward, especially in the, in, in the development of the grassroots campaign that we were talking, uh, that Patty introduced uh, me with a couple of minutes ago, is that we need to let AKC be AKC. It's that simple. We need to let AKC be the organization. Now, I also realize, uh, hopefully, uh, that I say that with risk, as two board members are sitting in this room and can have me fired at any particular moment. So, <laughs> wow, lots of questions here first. Just to back you up with your saying about lobbying must be local. In Maine, we were mostly successful in fighting off a complete rewrite of the animal welfare laws by an extremist. Right. Um, part of that rewrite pertained to one particular issue where one particular activist, who's a good activist on our side, but she had a database of 56,000 emails of her own. She put the word out to those 56,000 people on this one issue within right. the complete rewrite. Our agriculture committee received emails from all across the country and all around the world. It backfired. Yeah. It pissed them off. Yeah, sure. 
They don't want to hear from other people. No, no they want to hear from their constituents. That's exactly right. That was one of the major issues with us dealing with uh, 1634, at least as it was introduced last year, was uh, a lot of people wanting to ride in that were so frightened by the idea of, of mandatory spay neuter being implemented throughout the great state of California. And um, they were riding in in opposition to it. Well, what does someone from you know Meridian, Mississippi have to do with what the, pol the potential policies of California? Absolutely not. I have personally held back on the California issue. Mm -hmm. but, but, but if you're in the dog show community, you travel to these other places. That's and right. And it's and the economics. And you have, Absolutely. You right. have breed clubs that have people in every single area, and you make sure your breed club writes those letters. Absolutely. My breed club did, and I pointed out in the letter that I wrote to California for my breed club how many specialties we hold, right. how many people attend. Right. And, that, and, and that's why you, you get figures. You as stuff. a person might not be able to do it. But right, right. Listen, uh, there's, there's obviously a lot of questions, a lot of ideas running up here. Can we, let's let's agree to move, sort of move on and then we can come back in Q&A or afterwards. I think there's a lot of great discussion that can come from this. Yeah. Um, a lot of great ideas already. Lord, kill our good group. Um, this is uh, sort of a, an interesting slide. I didn't design it. Thank you very much. Um, that has to, that sort of really does, I think, identify sort of the, the, the fantastic nature of, 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 legislate, of legislation on the, on the state level. The point is, every one of these three boxes is an opportunity for us to infiltrate the process. Now, with us in, in legislation, most of the time we are reacting to incredibly onerous proposals that can really threaten our way of life and the, and the love that the, this, this love that we have of dogs and, and, and breeding and, and, and creating great dogs for the future. You know, when those onerous proposals are introduced, those proposals that can really be harmful for us, the, the proponents of those proposals have to win in every one of these stages. We don't. We have to win at one. That's the most important thing. Usually it happens in committee. But I've seen, you know, I've gotten bills beaten, not working for AKC, but I've gotten bills beaten by gubernatorial veto. So, you know, it, it, there's opportunities for us to work the process, and I think that's one of the inherent benefits as we move forward with our legislative issues, um, that there are opportunities for us to get into the system. Of course, the public policy arena, this is, this is a, an interesting slide, to say the least, and I think it's, it's rather too simplistic because it tries to show this, um, this continuum of animal ideology or animal, animal ownership ideology with responsible dog ownership on one side and um, the attempts to restrict pet ownership um, on the other. I don't like this slide very much because there are far too many different kinds of groups trying to, trying to influence animal policy in this country. NAIA has a wonderful download on their website. Go check it out. Barb Reitman first pointed out to me about a year and a half ago, and it is fantastic. It shows all these different types of groups that are trying to influence public policy. Often in our outreach, legislators don't know. They, legislators and their staff specifically think that animal policy in this country is usually singular in nature and it's being represented by one of two groups whose names I will not say again. <laughs> um, so this is a very useful tool in our outreach and I have used it by the way, it's really fantastic. Um, I wish our AKC's logo was on it, but uh, you know, I digress. Um, <laughs> but it gives them the opportunity to understand that animal policy in this country is not being directed by one ideological viewpoint that there are many, many aspects of animal policy in this country that need to be, they all need to be addressed through the political process. But of course, all of these influences come together in, um, in, in politics, and hopefully we have workable outcomes. So here's some challenges that are inherent to the political system, and we're, now we're going to start talking about the local issue, Jay. Um, you know, we have 50 state legislatures. And my job, I think, is, in spite of the bill volume of this past year, I think my job is fairly easy. Because every morning I have a bill status report that's printed up for me, and it sits on my desk, and it's, it's right there, and I know exactly for every one of the bills I track, I know exactly what's happened, I know who's voted what, I know if it's made it out of committee, I know every status change possible, and if it's been amended. I can quick, quickly search for new bills, and you know what? Life is pretty easy. But when you get down to the local level, life isn't so easy. Why? 
Because first of all, take a look at the number of jurisdictions, local jurisdictions in this country. It's the last bullet point on this slide. Over 33,000 local jurisdictions in this country. That's a lot. That's a lot for any organization to keep track of. Now, why is it difficult for AKC? Why is it difficult for anybody? There is no universal reporting system of local legislation in this country. Whereas, there are several wonderful companies that report on state legislation. No company offers that. Well, I'd, have, I'd, I'd be happy to pay. I'd be happy to give a good portion of my salary to make my life easier if I knew what was happening at a local level. We don't have that. We don't have it. Here's how we monitor state, uh, local legislation. We monitor it by news reports, and we do have a system that monitors news reports. And we rely on you. You guys, you know, if you could let us know, it's fantastic. Oftentimes on a local level, because of the nature of our lives. We have dogs. We have shows to go to. We need majors. We are chasing that best in show. We've got vaccination schedules and whelping schedules to follow. Those things are vitally important. And for a constituency, and, and I've been in this board now for about 20 years, um, you know, I grew up thinking about those things, and I did not have a legislative agenda. I just didn't. And when I was coming up through this board, I didn't have a legislative agenda. Why would I need a legislative agenda? Guess what? We need them. We need them now. We need to be active. Yes, ma'am. There's one other tap that the uh, Humane Society is taking, and that is a friend of mine went up to save some baby seals on the Sea Shepherd, and some instrumental helpers were uh, the Humane Society. And now their next tact is that owning dogs is a larger carbon footprint than one should have. So they're probably going to be infiltrating into the energy policy and everything else. I, wow. <laughs> There's a lot of opportunities for broad-based coalitions as we move forward. Charlotte, you had a 
question, comment? I just would like you to finish your talk. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So again, uh, you know, I can't re reiterate enough that this is probably the biggest inherent inherent challenge that we have when it comes to um, when it comes to our issues. 33,141 local jurisdictions in this country, and trying to not only understand the legislative process in those jurisdictions, but also the political realities in each of those is very difficult. Now, uh, I'll use our, our recent Dallas um, experience as an example. In Dallas, we were notified pretty early on that this was coming, and we had a, a little bit of a challenge mobilizing some of our folks. And what we ended up doing was we ended up having a really fantastic group of people working on the ground to make some changes happen and make sure, excuse me, that the mandatory spay neuter provision specifically was lifted and the incredible licensing, and I think it was, what was it, $500 per year per dog per breeder to be able to keep that dog intact. Um, yeah, make sure those kinds of provisions were taken out. I think what they did was fantastic and it was right. They were right on the money throughout the entire process. Unfortunately, they were a victim of politics, of city council politics. It was that simple. Unfortunately, that ordinance was going to pass. It was going to pass regardless of the great outreach we did. Not only did they have great, great outreach to their fellow constituents in Dallas, they had great outreach to the city council people. They, they had really fantastic press coverage. And um, it still didn't work. It still didn't work. I mean, you have, you, you have council people sometimes who will say things like, well, you know what? This happens all the time. We'll pass bad legislation the following year. We'll do away with it. We'll just come back and revisit it next year. It's like, well, what have you been doing? Spinning your wheels? I don't get it. But anyway, those sort of challenges are all inherent in this. And sometimes when, you know, most of the time when state legislatures are in session, there's lots of press coverage going on. It's easy to bring the light some major issues. And on the local level, it's just not that easy. And that's unfortunate. Did I just skip a slide? Here's the, the famous Michael Vick picture. I know some of you have been in my presentations before. I've seen it, and forgive me for giving into the cynicism a little bit, but you know, sometimes you hear news reports of certain issues, and I'll you know pretty much guarantee you that there's going to be legislation proposed as a result of those particular news reports. <coughs> BSL often has to do with an unfortunate dog attack, um, you know, some sort of major issue like that. Michael Vick, I think we can all agree. This was a horrible story in the media. Unacceptable, this behavior. Um, certainly we saw an increase in, in dog fighting bills. We saw an increase in cruelty bills. But the increase in breed-specific legislation after Michael Vick, because he was fighting pit bulls, was frightening. And it continues to be. And it continues to be. It really sort of ticks me off that there's not a week that goes by that I won't log on to CNN.com and there's not a headline story about a pit bull doing something in some jurisdiction. It drives me absolutely insane. I think one of the strategies we need as we move forward, as an aside, is, you know, we're good. We can improve in terms of our lobbying. We don't reach out to the media. We don't have that in with the media. And that's one of the things I, I hope that in government relations we can work with our PR department. I, I, would, I would like to see us get to the point where we have contacts in every newsroom of every major network affiliate in this country, of every, every media market up to, you know, down to 200 of them. That's the only way we can fully, I think, change the status quo in this country. People, the general public, hear the names, people for the ethical treatment of animals in the Humane Society of the United States, and those terms bring about a certain idea. And the media perpetrates those ideas. Now, we know differently. We totally know differently. The media doesn't know any different. Only certain, you know, minor aspects of the media do. And I think that's one of the things that we can do is, if, if not necessarily on NKC's part, but as a group, as a community, as a constituency, that we can do. We can, we can do better at. I'll give you a quick anecdotal story. A dear friend of mine, uh, who I've known for years, she's actually a news director in Arizona at the uh, CBS affiliate in Tucson. She wanted a Labrador. She called me and she said, I need some help finding a dog. I said, all right, understand this, that to find the right dog for you is gonna take you a year. She said, you know what, I'm willing to do it. And it did, it actually took her 14 months before she found the dog that she really wanted from the breeders and out of the dog she really wanted and she's very happy. And 
Jackson now is two years old, and I get you know little cards from Jackson with little hats and costumes on all the time. <laughs> A lot of you may be familiar with a really horrible story that was that came out of that area not so long ago, where there were I, I think the story was 700 or so chihuahuas um, that were seized in a kennel in that area. She called me one day at work and she said, "I don't understand how AKC can do anything." And I said, "Well, how much time do you have?" <laughs> so I got you know got to telling her you know first of all the reality is is that we can we can certainly and we do. We take care of our own house. Those people who register dogs with us, we're willing to take care of. And if there are substandard issues happening, substandard kennel issues, we're going to address it. We're going to address it. This has happened now for the better part of, what, 15, 16, 17 years that this is this program has been in place. And, um, and you know, we're the only registry that inspects. We're the only one that does it. Now that being said, I told her, these dogs weren't registered with AKC. And AKC is not a, a, an arm of law enforcement. We don't enforce the law. She never understood that. She had no idea that AKC didn't have that power. And so for her, it was an eye-opening opportunity. It was an eye-opening opportunity that suddenly she realized one of the values of AKC dogs is that the fact that you know we know they're coming from kennels that meet certain standards. And that is now. The relationship that has resulted is that she calls me first if there's a dog story in her community. I think that's a wonderful example. That's exactly what we need to do. I don't care if you have to send donuts to the news directors every Friday for a year. I've done that with legislative staff and it works, but I don't know if it works for news directors, but they may want alcohol instead. Um, but, but it's, it's one of the, th the inroads we have to make, yes sir. I, uh, I'm an instructor with the obedience training class at Harrisburg in Pennsylvania. We asked our students one day what they do. We found out that we had two reporters in our classes, one of them for the Patriot newspaper in Harrisburg and one of them for WHTM Television 27. And we helped uh, the latter find an English cocker puppy and uh, from a good reputable breeder in the area. So now, you know, I have those two folks email addresses right in this little yeah. gadget, and any time you know, any of that comes up. <laughs> it's no, th th I think that's an excellent example. I think that, that reporters, specific reporters who may be interested in, in or who may own AKC registered dogs or understand what the concept of responsible breeding and responsible dog ownership are, I think those are vitally important things to, to promulgate, especially I, I, I especially believe news directors. These are the people who make the calls, they assign reporters, they do all this stuff. They're the ones who we have to encourage them to think of us as a group, first and foremost. And the cat cancers. We, we gotta have them think of us first before anyone else. I think that's vitally, vitally important. Not HSUS and not PW. The goals of elected officials, the interaction of those goals, the capitalization of good public policy. It's a circular, circular creature. People want to be elected. Why do they want to be elected? They want power. They want to be re-elected to gain more power. The idea is, is that once they're in their institution for either their first term or their fit, they want to pass policy, pass laws, excuse me, pass laws that are going to be considered good. And so when it comes time to elect for elections, their constituents will say, oh yeah, well, you know, that Joe Blue representative, he did good on that one thing and or another, so, oh yeah, and I like him, I'll vote for him. It's a continuous cycle that we have to be a part of. And so what's really wonderful about the people here in this particular room is that you all are subject matter experts in every way, shape, and form. You are the subject matter experts. No one, someone said it earlier, stole my line, no one knows better about dogs and care of dogs in this country than the people assembled in this room. It's that simple. We are the subject matter experts. We have an opportunity to be involved legislatively in that outreach to affect good public policy. That's going to respect responsible dog breeders and responsible dog owners. The local government dynamic again. This is, you know, this I think there's there are some inherent challenges and some inherent opportunities. Taking a sort of a step forward from that last comment I made about being the subject matter experts and having an opportunity and say in the policy development. You know, most city and county commission people are part-time. They're they have real lives, real jobs, all that kind of stuff, and they do their stuff on part-time on, on their extra time. 
They rely on their staffs, and their staffs don't know animal policy. Who are they going to rely on? Who are they going to rely on? Someone from some foreign jurisdiction that doesn't really know what's going on? Or are they going to rely on their constituents and their communities who may be well known of having top winning English cocker spaniels? Or, you know, that person that does all that wonder, wonderful agility work? Or the people who work in the shelters and understand that? They're going to rely upon these folks. So it's a great opportunity for us as a group to market ourselves as, you know, these subject matter experts that can really make a fantastic difference. Um, you know, there's often a lot of times, and it always amazes me, and, and I guess because I always had this sort of preconceived notion that in a lot of communities, you know, all these volunteer boards and volunteer groups are going to be so incredibly, you know, stacked with folks, and, you know, there's, there's never any opportunity for me to have a say-so. That's really not true. If you check in your communities, your animal control commissions, your you know various entities like this, they're usually volunteer, and usually there's a lot of vacancies available. Check it out. Check out what opportunities are there and volunteer. Volunteer. Let them know. And if there aren't, work with your elected officials because when those vacancies do come up, they will have a say in what can who can be uh, sat on these particular um, on these particular boards and commissions and. What better place for us to affect good public policy? You know, the great thing too about the local level is that elected officials do have more direct contact with you. So take advantage of that. They often rely, however, on their professional staff. So, I was talking about the donuts a little while ago. Here's my funny story about the donuts. I worked in higher education in Louisiana, in higher ed policy, for a while. And often in my position, I had to get things from the Secretary of the State's office. And so, I was, Young, I was 21, 22 at the time, and um, I heard chuckles. Um, <laughs> You're still young. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I would go to them, and they didn't know me, and I would introduce, introduce myself uh, along with a hundred other people that were in the office, and they they wouldn't know me. So one of the things I would do is on Fridays I would um, I bring in donuts. I bring the staff members donuts, and it was a group of four ladies who worked in this little area. And they were the nicest southern ladies you've ever seen in your entire life. And they, they would be, always be like, oh, baby, thank you so much for the donuts. <laughs> so uh, one day my boss calls and he says, listen, I really need this. I need this now. I, you, you, this can't wait. So I, um, he needed a certain document for something he was working on from the secretary's office. So I called in, and, and her name was May Jean, and Miss May Jean answered the phone. <laughs> I said, Miss Maygene, this is Phil Guidry. Listen, I, I really need your help on something. And she's like, yeah, 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 what do you need, yada, yada, yada. And, and so I told her, and she's like, now, who, who are you again? I said, Miss Maygene, it's the donut boy. <laughs> she said, oh, Lord, darling, come over. I'll get your documents right now. <laughs> Telling you, don't underestimate the power of the donut. <laughs> It works. It works. <laughs> so here's some of the resources that we offer at AKC as we try to employ some of these strategies we've talked about. First, our website, akc.org. I know all of you have been to it, and I know all of you at one particular time have cursed the AKC website. <laughs> it is massive. There's a ton of information. It's hard to find data on it. I don't doubt it for a second. But we're trying to make it a little better. If you're looking for our GR department page, you can go to akc.org. You can look at the left-hand side of the screen. There's a, no, there's a link up there that goes directly to the GR homepage. You go to Government Relations, and it is so easy to navigate. It's big pictures, it's big words, there's not a whole lot of things. I can find stuff on it now. It's pretty exciting. Of course, if you have any general information requests or any comments, whatnot, there are two ways you can best get those comments to us. First is our general. It's a pretty, pretty elementary blog at this point, but it's an opportunity for us to sort of create a, a more steady line of communications with you all. And we're gonna we're gonna ramp it up a little bit with a nice RSS feed and do a few other things to make it a little more sophisticated. And we're gonna continue to issue our newsletter. It won't be on a, a nearly on, on the basis it was supposed to be on, uh, but we'll, we'll continue to do that. We issue legislative alerts. That's one of the things that we were asked about earlier. We can. 
we have a great number of people who subscribe to our legislative alerts. We can email those people in, in, in no time. But if there's something happening in your particular jurisdiction, in your town, or your city, give us um, give us a heads up. You know, tell us what you want to say. We'll, we'll control the messaging again. We'll control the messaging, but we'll be able to delve down. Much like Joan was explaining with, with her registrants, we can delve down into any jurisdiction um, for any number, any period of time. We can do litter registrants or dog owners um, for the past three years, five years in any jurisdiction, and be able to communicate with them pretty instantaneously via emails. So we have that power, we have that capability, and that does work very well. Um, if you want, I, if you have questions about what's going on in your jurisdiction, you can always call me and say, Phil, I need a pending legislation report, and I'll just pull that right up for you. Also, if there's something in your jurisdiction going on, um, and you want to have an influence on my inbox, you can say, Phil, I need you to analyze this particular bill or ordinance, and I'll be happy to do that. But we also uh, take every opportunity to intervene in the legislative process for you. Um, we have incredible outreach opportunities, again, via email and regular mail if necessary. We do, of course, put on seminars and dog shows, different dog events, federation meetings, whatnot, and we have, of course, a ton of brochures. Things like make your contact count. These, um, most of these are actually in these packets that I have up here, so after the presentation, come on up and, and get a packet, and my contact information is in there as well. No hate mail, please, I got enough of it. Um, but we, we have a lot of brochures, and, and, and these are actually very useful outreach tools. One of my favorite is the economic impact of dog shows. I sort of jokingly inferred earlier that, you know, politics is all about money. And a lot of times in the policy making process it is. And so when there is legislation that comes forward that may be threatening um, our ability to operate, conduct dog shows, conduct different events, we rely upon the economic impact of dog shows to, to as a tool to tell the local policymakers, hey look guys, you know, we understand where you're coming from, but are you willing to lose $3 million a year in tax revenue or, or ancillary revenues in your jurisdiction? It opens their eyes. I say that with a caveat. The economic impact information, it's a little dated. It was first originally done, I believe, in 1998 or 1999, and it has been adjusted for inflation and, inflation and cost of living increases. What we're, gonna, what we're doing now, we're, we have um, another department that we're working with and that's in the company. And we, we are conducting all of this research over again. What we're doing, though, is we're, making, we're, we're getting a little bit more sophisticated. We're doing it by region of country, by the region of the country. We know that what it costs to attend a dog show in Los Angeles, California, is not going to be the same thing as what it's going to cost to go to a dog show in Lake Charles, Louisiana. And so we want to be able to use data that is solid. We often, we, we've had a couple of instances in the past, and this is an aside, that we use this data and it's sometimes called into question. How valid is it? Well, we're, we're getting incredibly valid data. And so hopefully we'll have that product out in the, in the not too distant future. And we also offer public relationships and tools that really start to help along in the process. These are information packets as well. These, these are really fantastic um, pieces that we offer. These are folders, much look, look similar to those packets over there but there are folders that talk about different model legislation on any of these particular topics. Um, we're always formulating better ideas of what can work in terms of policy and policy types. So if there's any, if you hear, if you have a council person in your town, your city, your county, um, who's interested in maybe a, um, a dog park, creating a dog park in their community, we have actually great model legislation on that. So take a look, you know, always keep in mind that we have those, those resources readily available for you. <clears throat> the partnering resources, I think are, you know, it's key. We're not gonna be able to do this alone. We, we, we recognize that at AKC, we don't do it alone. State federations, uh, these are groups of owners. I know a lot of you are members of state feds. These groups of owners who have come together to really become the legislative experts in their jurisdiction. Um, you guys are the stars. You guys know what's going on. You all know better in your states the legislative policy or legislative issues uh, or the influences specifically better than I do sitting in my desk. You guys know what's happening. Um, we, we're, we are here to help you. It's that simple. Same thing though with national parent clubs. We're talking about, you know, people earlier, you might not want to get letters from Mississippi when there's a California bill. Um, 
in Sacramento that's moving around. National parent clubs are an exception. National parent clubs theoretically have members in every state in this country, and they have an interest in protecting their rights. So it's important that your national clubs are involved if, if your charters and bylaws so allow, that your, your parent clubs are involved. Local dog clubs, again, are a great opportunity to, um, to market yourselves as the subject matter experts, especially in local media, especially in local media. If there's something going on in your town, what's better than say, hey, this is you know, Phil Gidry, the president of the Louisiana Kennel Club, and here's what he has to say about the issue. Local dog clubs are a great resource. And our legislative liaisons program, it's really a wonderful program that we're, we're, we want to we want to turn it up a notch. We're, we've been talking about different ways to get this really going. So legislative liaisons receive notices uh, from us, and um, there's you know I think it, the idea is that they'll communicate to their to our fellow constituents about what's going on in their communities. I think they are an untapped resource for so many other things, and we're considering this. Look forward to some changes in legislative liaisons. <coughs> Untapped resources, AKC registrants and event participants. You know, in, in some cases, it is vitally important that, excuse me, whether or not someone lives in the jurisdiction, whether there's something that really bad can come down, that these uh, folks get involved. Um, you know, one of the things that I know is, is sort of pressing right now is one of the Pennsylvania bills that's going to affect uh, cropping and docking. And um, there's a great opportunity, I think, there for, and Julian might hate me for bringing this up, but, um, you know, I think there's a great opportunity there for the legislature to fully understand that this is not only going to affect people in Pennsylvania, it's going to affect people from a lot of jurisdictions. Um, and, and so, you know, there's certainly an opportunity there. Purebred dog owners, pet owners, we're all in the boat, to, the same boat together. And of course, Forming coalitions with appropriate groups, especially an organization like NAIA. It, it, it's, NAIA, I can only say, was as, as far as the little bit that I know about uh, 1634. <laughs> um, we have a lobbyist working on the issue, so uh, luckily that the whole responsibility of 1634 doesn't fall on me. But you know, working with NAIA over the course of the past year has really been a pleasure. And, um, and, and I know we all feel that in GR and, and all of NKC does. We all have. <laughs> We're all in the same boat. We're absolutely all in the same boat. And we, you know, someone mentioned it earlier, and this is my favorite story to come with. And yes, I'm, I am closing with 10 minutes about um, of Q&A. Um, you know, we have, we're, we're voters and we're constituents and we are, we're taxpayers. And whether or not we are organized as a group, we do have the power of the vote and we do have the power to use our political capital as we see fit. One of my favorite stories is the Truman story. Now, I don't know if it's true or not, so let me just qualify it as that, and I'll get crass here for just a second, but it's a funny story. Um, Truman had done something, as he was wont to do occasionally, um, that was pretty controversial. Of course, in those days, there were two modes of communication that were, that were you know, pretty well used, either telephone or mail. And so he was receiving a lot of mail in the Oval, and um, there were a lot of mail crates, wooden mail crates, that as he was going throughout his day, he kept knocking his feet on over and over and over again. And, um, you know, I would imagine that after jamming your toe for the 16th time over the course of the day, you're going to be a little upset. So he ends his day, and he goes off to, uh, goes off to the residence, and Bess yells out, how was your day? And he said, Bess? Why is it only sons of bitches know how to lick a stamp? That's how much email he got. The point is, I really like that story, I'm sorry. The point is, is that we have to be those people. We have to be those people that communicate, that yell at the top of our lungs when we need to. We need to be the ones who are gonna demand better policy from our policy makers. We have to be the ones who are gonna say, excuse me ma'am, Pardon me, sir, but I need to know something right now. I need to know how you're going to vote on this issue that I find vitally important, and I need to know this for two reasons. I need to know, number one, how you're going to vote, because I will decide right here and right now who I'm voting for in my next election, and I will decide right here, right now, who my contribution check is going to. And I guarantee you, more than anything, you're going to get some access. Now, that being said, 
we need political, we, we need as much, um, as many people in this fight as possible. AKC is here to help. Don't forget us. Don't, for all the other things that may be going on within, in the world of AKC, and there's a lot, GR is here to help. Don't forget us, please.
you know, it's a little, yeah, it's a little fun. Lita's idea about a P.O. box is a very good one, but also, you know, in this day and age, we all have email addresses. I don't know how important it really is anymore for us to have our personal addresses right, I agree. In, in the catalogs, and I'm not sure that that thought has really gotten across to ACM. And your cell phone, not your face phone. Charlotte. Yeah. Um, a couple of things, one of which is to talk about databases. And I'm, sh I'm sure that almost everybody in this room has received all kinds of, excuse me, crap on the rabies challenge. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's one activist in the state of Maine. Mm -hmm. She has gathered, obviously, a database that is international in scope, and one activist, and she's an activist, she's not one of us, has gone about doing this. So if you want to talk about databases, you can start forming your own. The other thing is I want to brag on Phil because I think he just hung the moon. Okay, get embarrassed. <laughs> in working with legislation in Massachusetts, when I got a sudden notice that something was coming up the next day and I read the bill and I didn't know how to frame the issue to make a difference because I knew I was going to be the only person going in to oppose the bill. When I contacted Phil, I got a legal analysis that I took in the next day and kind of almost read. And they listened to me and the bill got killed and I was the only one opposing it. So everybody can make a difference. You can use the AKC. Phil is outstanding and he can analyze the bill if you don't understand it. And he's great. Well, and, and let me just say this, and thank you very much, Charlotte. I really appreciate that comment. Um, you know, it's just it's part of my job, and, and one of the great things about working for the company in this particular in, in this particular position is that it marries my 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 love of the law with my love for dogs, and so it's 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 an honor to work for the company and, and an honor to work with you all. In particular, to that Charlotte, Char you know, Charlotte and I got off to a really good start a couple of years ago, and, and, and she and I worked really well together. Um, and sometimes I'm absolutely swamped, and, and, and you know, seeing Jay here, it's like, I know Jay's called me a couple times, and Jay might not get me on the phone, but he's going to get Walt on the phone. He's going to get somebody on the phone who's going who's gonna to be able to address the situation. And so, it's just sort of, we, we're very fluid sometimes in our work. Sometimes you get one person, sometimes you won't. It's just that simple. But call us and let us know, and keep pounding us, and you're going to get something from us. Yes, sir. Julie. I have a, uh, an anecdote which actually supports something that you said and I think bridges to tomorrow's discussion because one of the great things that happened before the, testifying before the committee in Pennsylvania was when the ASPCA was doing their testimony and they were showing all these 10 year old photos that they always carry around with them about uh, puppy mills and one of the committee members had been scripted by somebody and he asked a very simple question and it's the you know, what, what are you doing here, question. Do um, you guys have a kennel in Pennsylvania? Yeah. And the answer, and, I mean, they turned red, and they had to say, no, we don't. And you can ask that the same question to HSUS, if you can get your legislative people. Then you have the ability to say, you know, the ASPCA and HSUS testified before the House that they have nothing to do with this state. And that gives you a tremendous PR piece that you can put out there. Absolutely. Uh, just to add to that, the other question that same gentleman asked them and each of the other people that was testifying that day was, have you been consulted about these changes? And the sportsman's group, the kennel club group, all of the groups said, no, we have not been consulted. The ASPCA sat down there and said, Oh, yes, we were asked about this. <laughs> this is where we gave this information, we gave that, and all of a sudden all the legislators kind of went, what? You haven't yeah. talked to anybody in the state and you've talked to this national group? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and unfortunately, that, that ends up being a sort of this a, a reality in, with some of these major bills in the states is that the beginning work toward introduction of some of these bills is absolutely frightening because it's all outside influences and it's all ideological influences from certain sources. I think Pennsylvania is a very good bill to, to pull to sort of consider 2525. The history with 2525 is really amazing because of first it was a regulatory proposal, then it became legislation, and what the Pennsylvania Federation has done and all their groups and the sportsmen included um, has been really amazing. They have substantively addressed 
most of the major issues that anyone has ever talked about in opposition to this bill. And there's a few more changes that we're working on, but they, you know, they, they've done a really fantastic job. And so remember, to if politics, legislative process, sometimes it requires hip boots. And, and it does because, that, yeah, it, it's, um, it's a long drawn out process sometimes. I mean, with 1634, we're, we're at 18, 18 months now into the 1634 battle. Yeah, and then 10. Yeah. Is that how many it's been? I'm waiting for 11. Frightening. That's absolutely frightening. Okay, question, yes, sir. I just have one very practical suggestion. Uh, back, uh, back in the fall primary season, my local legislators, uh, Pennsylvania State Legislature, announced his retirement. And out of the woodwork came seven Republicans. This guy's a Republican. So seven Republicans come out and one Democrat. And the local committee decides to have a debate. So I got myself into that, you know, debate that night and talked to every single one of those people on the stage so that no matter which one of them ended up winning in the primaries, I had already talked to them. And ever since, they you know, had the primary and the, win, the lady won, the one Republican lady that won. I have her email address and every single thing that's been going on with this dog legislation 2525 and the others in Pennsylvania, I've been copying her on. Mm -hmm. So when she gets into office, or in the Demo her Democratic opponent too, either one of them gets into office, they already know me. Sure. Sure. It's just one of the ways you can build bridges and we have to build those bridges. Yes, ma'am.
financially. No, I think they wanted to throw a bone out to breeders and say, we're going to dumb this down and, hey, look, we're compromising. Now it's only, you know, $100 per year per intact dog or whatever the fee ended up being. Um, you know what? I think it's, it's art and it's nuanced. The problem is, is that one of my big fears with a lot of, of, of our folks is that we can be, end up being painted as always opposing everything. And if you oppose everything all the time, you marginalize stuff. You just marginalize yourself and your effects in the future. Um, I'm not saying, you know, I, 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 I don't think there's any formula. I don't think there's anything in, in particular. I, I think knowing the political climate, especially surrounding a bill, and whether or not it's a majority party bill or a minority party bill and how that's going to be affected um, throughout the process, I think that's vitally important in, in, in knowing whether or not a bill has a chance. Um, 538, you know, 538 was, was certainly one of those bills where it was, you know, it was a little frightening as we continued on through the process. It got murkier and murkier and murkier. Um, you know, and, and in those cases, I think when it comes to, at least from NKC's perspective, when it comes to some things we absolutely will not tolerate, you know, you oppose it. It's that simple. You oppose it. And there are some things sometimes where, you know what, if, if you know for sure that a legislature, for example, is going to go for limits, you're, you know, you're going to be stuck with a limit. Sometimes you might have to negotiate a limit. And there's probably nothing more esoteric, ambiguous, and uh, awful than negotiating a certain limit. And sometimes it happens. So my answer is, as every good lawyer, I don't know. <laughs> uh, as you've said a number of times, you don't live there, you don't vote there. But I know you live in my hometown, Raleigh. <laughs> How do I sit down with you to start laying the groundwork for the LA type legislation that is being seeded? for a long session starting in January. We Seven know it's coming. Day. And the second part of it is, how do we start doing some of that mailing to the North Carolina community about the legislation that's coming? You tell me what you want. Okay. And I am working on a presenter for you for next month, for October. Yeah, I've asked Phil to come and talk to the North Carolina Federation of Dog Clubs. And he declined me. I've He's got probably got an yeah. entry at a dog show. No, I, I, I do have <laughs> a license on the outside of the I know. Of AKC politics. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know it. So and I know you're working right? on a good replacement. Yeah. Well, Thank you, Bobby. Sending the Bombay Sapphire. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what? Let's be honest. A little vermouth, too. <laughs> Be at Shaggy's in Cleveland on Thursday. <laughs> Thank you very much. The two top organizations, I believe, are AKC and NAI. We work hand in hand on all these legislative issues. And in order for him to help carry the legislation, we have to. <laughs>